This video started when I glanced at my terminal window one day and really noticed something for the first time. It's this TTYS00 at the top. And I'd seen it a thousand of times before. But suddenly I found myself asking, what is this TTY? TTY stands for teletypewriter. Well, in the 1960s and 70s, these were literal typewriters wired to the mainframe computers. The mainframes I'm referring to are, for example, PDP-11 mini computers or IBM Systems 360 room-sized computers. A PDP-11 or IBM 360 had no built-in video card or a built-in monitor the way a modern computer has. So the teletypes were there to communicate with the computer. And these teletypes are the reason why, even now in 2025, Linux still uses this TTY terminology to describe your virtual terminals. The word virtual is there because the terminal itself is now just an illusion that the computer creates using software. Instead of being a standalone piece of hardware that sits on a desk or is even on its own stand. And it consumes its own power and space. Now the operating system is emulating the behavior of that separate, single-purpose device from back in the days. In 1970s, there were two types of physical terminal. At first, a teletype was a self-contained keyboard plus a printer device. And it was cabled to a host by a serial line. And then you could have multiple such keyboard plus printer devices connected to the mainframe. And I believe back in the day, it was even a job to be a teletype writer. And since the mainframes or mini computers did not have a display hardware of its own, all text appeared on the terminal's paper. But over time, the loud paper teletypes were replaced with teletypes with screens, or CRT terminals. And the CRT abbreviation here stands for the cathode ray tube, that big heavy glass picture tube that made 20th century's uh, TVs and computers monitors work. Like this one CRT inside uh, an early Macintosh Plus computer back in the days. And today in modern computers, a chunk of RAM buffer pretends to be that screen. So one monitor can juggle many such screens. And as a result, we get virtual terminals. And so the PC's single keyboard can also be shared among multiple such terminals. So you see the progression here. We first started with paper teletypes, then we moved on with the CRT terminals with screens where both of these were still standalone physical units connected to the mainframe computer. And now we have two software descendants living inside the modern computer. Virtual terminals like TTYs that carry on the original tradition from the teletypes back in the day, and terminal emulators using PTYs that create terminal-like windows in our graphical desktops. And by the way, the TTY abbreviation is exclusive to Unix-like systems like uh, Linux, Mac OS, uh, BSD, etc. Windows has a completely different history and terminology. Now, how TTYs work today? Now we just said that on a Linux system we can have two distinct terminal-like behaviors. First, it's those virtual pure text mode consoles, usually called TTY1 through TTY6, and terminal emulator application windows, like GNOME Terminal or Alacrity or iTerm2 on Mac, or whichever you prefer, there is a choice there. Now, here's an important distinction that often trips people up, and myself included. I was confused for the longest time myself. But when we say TTY or PTY, we're actually talking about two different things. There is a device, which is a piece of kernel code that handles the communication, and then there is an interface. This is what you typically see when you enter either a pure uh, text mode TTY or you open a terminal window like GNOME Terminal. So when you're on that black text console or looking at the terminal emulator app window, you are looking at the interface. But underneath there is usually a kernel device, a TTY or a PTY. So these kernel devices are basically a specialized piece of code that runs your operating system that handles a lot of details behind the screen, whether that's talking directly to the hardware or creating connections between different programs. Next, I'll give you a quick little demo on what it looks like on Linux to use a pure text console and switch between those and then go back to your regular graphics session. But first, before I show you the demo, a quick housekeeping for the Mac users uh, before we go time traveling. I typically work on a Linux virtual machine that lives inside uh, my MacBook. And some of the key bindings inside the VM don't work very well without some settings change, 
um, if I don't do them on the macOS side. So for that to work, I need to go to settings on my macOS and then I'll go to keyboard. And in there, I go to keyboard shortcuts, function keys, and I need to turn on this setting. Otherwise, um, whenever I will try to press, say, Control Alt F3 or Control Option F3 or any other F function, I would need to press Fn key for this key binding to work. And to be honest, this totally feels like doing finger yoga. I've done it before and it's not convenient, so I turned on that setting so that it's easier. And now the fun part. So let's try and enter a, a TTY, pure text mode. So I'm now inside my uh, Fedora virtual machine. So I log in. Okay, so let's close that here. And now if I press Control Alt F3, it brings me to the pure text mode console um, called TTY3. Um, I can switch between those. If I press Control Alt F1, I'm just um, landing inside the graphical login manager. And by default, uh, I think it's assigned to TT1. Control Alt F2 brings me back to my uh, graphical user session. Then Control Alt F3, I'm back in the TTY3. I can do F4, F5, F6. Now the question, why I do care about this TTY thing? Um, it's not just some historical trivia, but you might also want to care about this too, especially if you're working on a Leland Compositor, then this becomes very relevant. So the whole reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm working on a side project that I announced in my last video. Uh, I would like to write my own minimal Wayland Compositor that has a certain functions uh, which others don't have, uh, mainly just for fun, maybe just to learn a lot more about what I know about Linux, knowing about how to use TTY and how to run stuff for from inside uh, a pure text mode console uh, becomes really relevant. Now, the problem is that when you're working on a project like this, uh, two compositors can't share a single display. They'll conflict over input and rendering because if you try to write your code and debug it and try to test it, like compile, run for testing, you do it inside an existing desktop session, uh, your say GNOME Compositor, that is Mutter, will interfere with your new Compositor. Well, you got a problem. And so when I want to test my new Compositor, when I want to compile and try running it, um, I need it to be isolated from my main GNOME session, for example. Now that's where the TTY comes in uh, really useful. Um, I can switch to a spare TTY and launch my Compositor there. So from what I learned, um, when I do that, my composer takes over that TTY and transforms it into a graphical session. It might not be super fancy because the new composer like will be bare bones, but it still should be usable. And then if something goes wrong, I can easily switch to the TTY that hosts my uh, regular uh, graphical GNOME session and do whatever needs to be done. Now, I also learned that apparently for prototyping and writing my code, I could actually try and run it inside a window, inside the GNOME session, um, sort of like a nested development environment. So it might be easier for debugging purposes this way, but for final testing, running it uh, standalone from a TTY would give me real, quote unquote, bare metal experience meaning that my composer can talk directly to the hardware via kernel services like DRM and libinput, and therefore bypassing any other compositor layer and preventing interference. And finally, I hope that this video about TTY was at least somewhat interesting to watch as it was for me to research it. So next time when someone complains that Linux is stuck in the past, you can just hit Control alt f3 and show them that sometimes the past is exactly where you want to be in order to debug the future. I'll see you in the next video.